الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بسنته لا يوم الدين. All praises due to Allah and may Allah's, <coughs> may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. Prior to the break for Salah, we talked about the last of the major rites of Hajj, those are for the day of Eid, the tenth day of the Hijjah. And we spoke about the difference between trimming and shaving. And we had spoken about that earlier. Shaving is more humbling, and this is why it is preferred. Trimming is allowed, but the greatest and the greater reward is for those who shave. And this is specifically for men. For the women, it is trimming um, a portion of the hair gathered and cut. Shaving was not prescribed for them. Some scholars would consider it makru or disliked. Some have even made it haram. <clears throat> but we don't have any clear statements of the Prophet ﷺ with regards to it beyond you know, telling the women to trim and the men to shave. And as we said, this symbolization that is there in the shaving is linked to the other time in our lives when our heads were shaved. And that was at the time of the aqiqah. The ceremony on the seventh day that we do, it's not really a ceremony, I mean, we. There are certain things that the Prophet ﷺ advised us, encouraged us to do, to shave the head of the child. And the hair that you shave from the head of the child is actually in Arabic called aqiqah. That's where the name comes from. So the name is directly related to the aqiqah. People call it the naming ceremony. And so sometimes they won't even shave the head of the, ch the child. You know, the, the women may feel that it's a girl and she doesn't have much hair on her head already, so it's better not to shave it, you know. So, you know, they may be resistant to the shaving. But the whole point of the aqiqah is to shave the head of the child. You don't do shave the head of the child, you didn't do aqiqah. Simple as that. So, shaving the head of the child, then, you know, giving its weight in silver or gold as charity, and naming the child at that time, slaughtering an animal, two for males, or one if that's what you can afford, and one for females. The food is, the, the, it could be cooked up and given, shared with neighbors and others, eaten from yourself, or the meat itself could be divided up and given. Anyway, the point is that on this day, we are slaughtering an animal and shaving our heads. It reminds us of that day. When that head was shaved as a child, it represented a new stage in life. Having been in the womb, that was the hair that grew on our heads when we were in the wombs of our mothers. Now, we are doing the rites of Hajj and concluding those rites, or part of those rites, again now with slaughtering and shaving. And we know that the Hajj symbolizes a new start. Because we 
are supposed to be purified from sin through performing the rites of Hajj according to how they were prescribed. So there is that link, like a new lease on life. And part of what should remind, remind us to be careful to stay on track after the Hajj. So Hajj is not just an event with no real impact on our lives. Following that, we have Tawaf al-Ifada. And actually the Tawaf al-Ifada is the same as Tawaf al-Qudum, except there is no Sa'i. Except there is no Sa'i. And the Tawaf, we can see, we spoke about the significance of the Tawaf in that it is one of the most oft repeated rites of the Hajj. It's put at the beginning when we came in making the Umrah. It's put in the middle here in Tawaf al Ivada. And it will be put at the end again. We'll look at Tawaf al Wida. And it, as we said, or as the Prophet ﷺ said, is a walking prayer. In our lives, prayer has, has been standing, bowing, prostrating, and sitting. Now, we pray while walking. And the Prophet ﷺ actually said that. That tawaf is salah, except that we speak in it. So, the tawaf al ifada should be done with the same spirit we spoke about in tawaf al qudum that this is worshipping Allah. It shouldn't be done mechanically. We shouldn't be using uh, books that we just read from. We don't know what is being said there. Better we make du'as from ourselves. Also, in making the, the tawaf, we said that we should be seeking uh, forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, glorifying Him. So, what we normally do in our prayers with Fatiha and the surahs after and the transitional words that we say or phrases that we say, Sami Allahu liman hamida etc. All of these uh, involve praising Allah or seeking His forgiveness. In the same way, when we're making tawaf, we should be doing the same. And it should come from our hearts. Because repeating after somebody, which is the common practice, people get in groups, one person buys the, the tawaf book, which tells you on the first tawaf, and they've got a different du'a for every tawaf, you know, for every, every tawaf of hajj and umrah, etc. Uh, when actually these are not prescribed. They have good meanings, most of them, but they're not prescribed. So people have taken those to be necessary du'as to make. But the best du'as are the ones which come from ourselves. Because we are calling on Allah, we are seeking His guidance, seeking His forgiveness. It can only be done effectively and sincerely if we know what we are saying. And the tawaf links the hajj from beginning to end and it addresses the issues of change that should happen in us. We should be calling on Allah's help to make this Hajj acceptable and a means of change in our lives. And the last 
tawaf, tawaf al wida'. This is the concluding act of Hajj before leaving Mecca. We make tawaf, which is unique to Masjid al Haram. We don't make tawaf any place else. Although you will find, as we mentioned earlier, people making tawaf, you know, in Ajmer, around the tomb there, in Egypt, and in other countries, we have the tombs or mausoleums of saints, etc., that people go and make tawaf around, even writing notes, putting them inside the cages that they put around the graves, believing that when everybody leaves, the saint comes out of his graves, collects the notes and reads them, and does something for you. you know, may Allah guide the ignorant. So, in leaving Mina, on the last day, because we're after the 10th, we have the 11th and the 12th, where we go back to Mina. And again, the rites of Mina focus on the same three that we spoke about. We have added to it stoning. And on the third of those days, on the 13th or on the 12th, we can leave Mina. And at that point, we should leave Mina feeling we have, we've left behind us something precious. We shouldn't be leaving Mina, wiping our foreheads and saying, ah, finally, it's over. As so many people tend to do, you know. Uh, if that's how we're leaving it, then it means we've missed out on the Hajj. It hasn't purified us. We have not benefited from the right. We have not grown closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, grown in our consciousness of the deen. When we leave the holiday places that we go to, we leave there with a heavy heart. Holiday is over. Going back home. So we feel sad to go back home. But unfortunately, most people when they're leaving Mecca, and leaving the Hajj, Mina, they're treating it just the opposite. They're happy to go home. We've had enough. And this is the sign that we missed the boat. The Kaaba is the focal point of prayer for Muslims all over the world. It's not an object of worship. Though people might be fooled into thinking that, who watch us from the outside, non-Muslims observing us, might very well conclude that we worship the Kaaba. But reality is, of course, that we don't. It's a means of organizing our worship. The 1.7 billion Muslims around the world, we're all facing the Kaaba in our worship. But the vast majority of Muslims will never see the Kaaba. So those of us that manage to get there and actually see the Kaaba with our own eyes, this should have real value in our lives. It should touch our lives. There are a number of figures in the modern times of people from the West, etc., who accepted Islam and came to Mecca, and they've written about their impressions, how it impacted on them. It's good to read some of their stories to better understand the way we should be feeling. The Kaaba represents Tawheed. There's only one. As there's only one Allah, there's only one Kaaba. There's only one human race, 
And there's only one religion. It's Tawheed in its completeness. Now I'll give you a chance to ask some questions if you'd like to ask. Um, also to mention that the, this course on the soul of Hajj is available on the Islamic Online University's website among the free diploma courses. You can take it there where I go into more detail. Another course which I'd given here a few years back. And I've gone there into Medina also because for a lot of people Hajj is not Hajj unless you go to Medina. This time here I've just focused on Mecca, the actual Hajj. But uh, that is added information. Most people who go end up going to Medina also. So there's additional information there about what is to be done there, uh, the significance of the various places of Ziara, and um, the rewards and benefits from visiting Medina. The Islamic Online University uh, fundamentally is a free university providing free courses on Islam for over 250,000 students around the world. It also provides courses at almost free costs, costs which are just registration fees, about $150 per semester, meaning that it's about $1,200 here for a degree, an accredited degree. We also, uh, if you are in one of the third world countries, it's only $70 per semester, or it might be $80. It's really, it's, the rates have been set according to the, the GNP of the various uh, countries around the world. So we do offer Islamic studies, as you can imagine. It's called Islamic Online University. So we have Sharia as a main uh, bachelor's program that we offer. We also have masters in Sharia, Islamic studies. But we also offer a bachelor's in education, as well as Islamic banking and finance, also in psychology, information technology, business administration, in Arabic language and linguistics. Uh, these are the courses, and we are adding new courses uh, each year, ultimately to be able to teach whatever can be taught online make it available to the Ummah. The motto of the university is changing the nation through education. And we are reaching out to various uh, communities, Muslim communities around the world. Right now we're focusing in Africa as well as in Asia. And uh, we're trying to provide access to tertiary education to those who normally would not have it. It's not merely to make it cheaper for those who could afford it, but fundamentally it is for those who can't afford it, and it will give them the opportunity to be able to get it. So we are working with uh, different communities, different parts of the Muslim world, to try to promote the courses for the needy of the various communities. One of the areas that we're focusing right now is on orphanages. We have many orphanages that, which have been set up by charitable organizations you know, across the Muslim world, Muslim communities. But these orphanages, while providing for orphans, once that orphan has completed his secondary education or her secondary education, the provision and support ends. 
and they're left on their own. And actually, finishing this job is critical because the time that they most need support is when it comes to tertiary education. So we are trying to link up with some of the charitable bodies that are concerned and uh, when this is brought to them, actually many of them haven't thought about it. They just took it for granted when you finished high school, that's it. You're on your own. We've done our part. You know, people don't usually donate beyond that for them. So we have sort of tried to wake up these uh, charitable institutions to consider this seriously, that we need to finish the job of educating the orphans of the Ummah. So, inshallah, if any of you would like to help with uh, this project, we encourage you to participate with us. Uh, if you in your country uh, have contacts with certain charitable organizations that you would like to put us in touch with, that we can help, we are only too happy to help. Barakallah fikum. Thank you all for coming and may Allah make whatever knowledge was shared beneficial for you in your lives and we hope that you would share it with others because I'm sure there are points that have been raised which uh, maybe you weren't aware of, etc. And many others around you are not aware. So uh, please do share that knowledge because the greatest reward is in sharing the knowledge after getting it. And um, pass on the word to others also to benefit from the recording of this series, especially your friends who are planning to make Hajj. Recording of the series uh, is available uh, at the Islamic Online University website. بارك الله فيكم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد ولا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك.